You're listening to Deeply Curious, a podcast about our ever-evolving philosophy of life and faith and the curious pursuit of knowledge and wisdom. My name is Cody Jensen. And I'm Sarah Jensen. And in this episode, we're going to be talking about mental capacity, or you could really think about that about being a margin or limitations. Mm -hmm. And we want to talk about mental capacity because as we have been going through our journey of becoming who we are basically our whole life, but especially within the last three, four years, we have kind of been in this like trial by fire, intensive growing and moving towards becoming the people we want to be Mm -hmm. and have been able to find language to talk about things that we have felt for a long time. And finding the language allowed us to overcome some hurdles to move forward in our journey of emotional intelligence, intellectual intelligence, et cetera, et cetera. And I think one of the most helpful things to accept is the reality of capacity. Mm -hmm. Each one of us, has our own specific set of circumstances that lead us to our own individual capacity as a person. We all have our own limitations. My limitations are different than your limitations. Right. Your limitations are different than mine. And our personalities are different. Mm -hmm. Our socioeconomic um, family of origin, et cetera, et cetera. Sarah and I, we are, we have, pretty similar in that Mm -hmm. but even in that we have different right things that take our take different things from us which anything that takes from you is reducing the amount of capacity you have right um but different different capacities isn't a bad thing either i mean definitely our culture tells us we should look and act and speak and do in a certain way which i think is what causes obviously a bunch of like where we're all at right now, particularly in 2020. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But finally learning and understanding limitations and capacities isn't a bad thing. In fact, it's very freeing. Correct. Yeah. So margin has been said to be the space between your load and your limits. So the first thing you have to accept within that is that you have limits. Right. So we have grown up in this generation. It's hard for the millennials. <laughs> we're, it's so because we we've been told our entire life, you, you can be anything. Nothing's impossible. Yeah. You can do anything. You can be anything. And as well meaning as our parents' generation was, right. That's a lie. They yeah. were lying to our face. And it has caused us some issues. Right. So I heard a quote that in a society where everything is possible Mm -hmm. is the only society that leads people to believe that nothing is possible. Huh? Because if you are living in a thing where everything is possible and you go on this journey of becoming who you are supposed to become and you keep constantly coming up to these limits and you're stopped and then you try again and you're stopped, you're try again and you're you're stopped, you you just become disillusioned and then you start to believe that nothing is possible. And then you start to go into depression. We are more depressed now than we've ever been as a nation and we may be one of the most depressed time periods in human history. Right. It's it's like um, unrealistic expectations or unmet expectations and then you're confused (laughs) <laughs> right. Why your whole life is a lie. <laughs> yeah, I mean, your our, your entire life philosophy has been built upon the fact that you are limitless. That right. if you put your mind to it, if you work hard enough, that you can overcome any limit, including the limit of time, including the limit of your own body, including the limit Resources. of biology, you know, your biological need to sleep. You Privilege. can overcome <laughs> any sort of limitation to become whoever it is you desire to be. Unfortunately... That's just not true. You can only be who you are. Right. And it is in the accepting of who you truly are that I think you find happiness, contentment, joy. And if you are of, you know, the more mysterious things of the world and if you, you know, label it as God, um, a quote that I really like from Pete Scazzaro is, we find God's will for our life in our limitations. Right. 
And I think that that can be applied. Oh, for sure, it can be applied to life, even if you don't I think call it's, it God. It's it's definitely maybe hard to swallow. Mm -hmm. I think you'd have to sit with it for a while and really be open minded. I mean, at least, I mean, I believe that, and I still have a hard time saying like, yeah. Right. <laughs> Part of me is like, uh, I don't want that to be true. <laughs> Within a max capacity, within margin, the space between your load and your limits, do you have an example or how would you explain that? Because it's you have to you have to really understand what it means to be a limited person. Yeah, I think a good way maybe to say it is that we sort of assume that if we have four hours of free time, that we should fill four hours of time. Mm -hmm. But. That's not how you should go about thinking about it because you have to also within however much time you have, consider how much energy you have and how much energy you need to save. So like if we're talking about like getting tasks done right in your work day, you fill up to the max capacity of your time and energy and mental capacity the four hours or whatever. But then you didn't consider the fact that you have to go home and you need energy and mental capacity to be with your family. And so you've already maxed out before you've even finished your day. Like, I think that's how we sort of view things. It's like, well, I mean, technically I have two hours. I should fill these two hours. That is living on burnout. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is how you get to the place where we're all at now, where we're just like kind of slowly collapsing. <laughs> right. You know, is because we technically, it might look like you have a margin of time or energy, but, but you don't really because you have to think about everything else. Mm -hmm. John Mark Homer had a really good picture of this that I really enjoyed. Um, but it was a visual representation and this is a podcast, so I have to, it's hard to do. you know, it's kind of hard to do, right. but what, um, John Mark argues that I firmly, um, have, ex that I firmly believe because I have experienced it in my own life is that we have a different limit than just our maximum capacity. We have our emotional limit mm -hmm. or our emotional and spiritual limit and everybody is going to be different. But let's say that my emotional limit is halfway to my maximum limit. And whenever I reach that emotional limit, and that's whenever I lose my ability to truly live well. Right. That's whenever I lose that larger view of the world where I start to think in the micro and I start to get uh, anxious and I start to get short and I start to get into a hurry and I become the worst version of myself because myself is being burdened myself is being buried under all of these things that i'm putting in me and i'm not able to tr truly see past all of these things that are taking up past my emotional and spiritual limit mm -hmm. do you have another way to say that no i think that's good but another example i think every introvert can understand <laughs> is like like introverts are very capable obviously of being around people or going to networking events or or large parties or whatever but you can feel when you're doing it gladly and when you're doing it out of i guess obligation and i feel like like you can feel the different energy you bring to like those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And it's when you're, or at least for me, when I have hit my capacity and I haven't given myself space that I start showing up a little maybe resentful mm -hmm. <laughs> that I have to be there. Like I can feel that limit very quickly if I don't give myself, it's not max capacity. I can still go about and be social but it's just not the same. It's it's not the same for me personally. It feels like a responsibility or an obligation versus an like an exciting opportunity. Right. So Sarah and I have different limits. Sarah has a lower social limit than I do. If we were to have the exact same day mm -hmm. and we were spending our entire day together, mm -hmm. one, you spending your entire day with me is already taking up some 
of your social limit. Right. But then if we hung out with uh, a, f- a couple people, then that takes a little bit more of your social limit, a little bit of mine too, but not as much. Right. But then we go to maybe a group networking party. That's going to wipe you out. Yes. For the rest of the day. Maybe um, even the next day. Yeah. <laughs> and the next day after that. <laughs> um, and you only have so much energy to give per day. Yes. Because of Sarah's specific capacities, her social capacity limits her capacity and everything else. Yes. Because if the social capacity is maxed out and it wipes out her energy capacity, then the energy capacity can... It affects everything. Right. It affects everything. It affects work. It affects doing laundry when I need to do laundry. It affects me going to exercise because I'm just too tired to get out. You know, like it affects everything. So... Within that, that's where I think we have to look at ourselves and recognize in ourselves that we have a, there's not a certain number, but let's just say a dozen. There are a dozen different limitations that we have on our life. Um, So maybe some examples of limitations. Each one of us has a different body. Right. My body limitations are different than a bodybuilder's limitations. Right. And different than a child's limitations. And obviously we understand that. I mean, Sarah comes to me to open up a pickle jar and rude. I'm <laughs> I'm not weak. <laughs> but that's true. <laughs> but that's because Sarah's bodily limitation yeah. hits before mine. I have no upper body strength. And I have so much upper body strength that I can open a pickle jar with using my shirt easily. (laughs) So we obviously understand that whenever it comes to each individual body, but it goes way beyond that within our emotional limitation. Mm -hmm. What is the emotional limitation that we have that in order to give, there's only so much emotions we can give. There's only so many emotions that we can take in before we we reach our emotional limit. And when we reach our emotional limit, that like just like everything else, doesn't allow us to fully operate well within the rest of our limitations or the, the more so the rest of our capacities. So let me just before I get too deep into each one of these, just a few more examples. We have our body limitation, our emotional limitation, a relational Im- uh, limitation, a social limitation, um, a task or economic limitation. So money. If I make a clone of myself, all the same limitations, all the same capacities, but the clone happened to win the lottery, that means that my clone is going to have a different set of limitations entirely because his economic limitation or his economic capacity is much higher. Right. And so each one of these things creates an overall capacity of ourself. Right. And then some capacities are applied to everyone equally, specifically time. Nobody has more than 24 hours a day. Right. This is one of the only limitations that is universal. A story that I really like is Bill Gates. Bill Gates obviously is a Mm multi-billionaire, i.e. never has to have a thought about money and can Anything, any limitation he has in his life that has the ability to be increased by money. He can do. He can do and has done. Yeah. But he's obsessed with time and micromanaging his time to the minute. Yes. Because he knows and he realizes you, he, he can't buy more time. Yeah. That's so, his only limitation he cannot fix. So those are some limitations. So just some examples of limitations. There are many more. Mm-hmm. But those are just some examples of limitations that we all have to operate within. And within those limitations, each one of those has a different capacity based on our own life and biological circumstances. Right. Yeah. Like I think maybe a good example is, I mean, I've been saying for, I don't know, five years or something that I just don't have the mental space. I need mental space because my capacity is whatever. Like whenever we're talking about um, me trying to find time to write, you would say like, you have plenty of time. And that's true. I, I do have plenty of time, but I have always struggled to find plenty of mental capacity because I am so introverted and uh, I 
I need more space than most. Like I'm 97% introverted. I'm very high on the introverted scale, which I've always known, but I've never known how to like carve out the time without feeling guilty for not being around other people because our culture and society is that it's very extroverted and so for introverts it's a, it's a really hard balance to find because if you give an inch they'll take a mile that's pretty much the general consensus so i have always found it very difficult to get all of my other limitations and capacities in line with my time So like I have plenty of time and I'm sitting there, but like my brain can't get there because it is over its limit. Mm -hmm. It is running on empty, you know? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's been like five years that I've been saying like, I just don't have the mental capacity. And I think within the last, what is it, year that Mm -hmm. we've been like talking about this kind of stuff, I'm finally starting to figure out what that actually means. And relationally, it's helping me yeah. to understand you so that we can have the language to talk about the emotional things that are happening in our life. Right. Um, because for years you would say, I just don't have the capacity. And to me, as somebody who, especially at that time, which was only connected with a more cerebral view of the world and not very much an emotional view of the world. Yeah, very um, achievement-based. Right. And yeah. so I was very much in my head, I, a, a complete realist whenever it came to the way I viewed the world. Mm -hmm. Um, And I'm still very much a realist, but now I also am way more in touch with my heart and the emotional being, the emotional creature that I am Mm -hmm. and am able to understand Sarah because I understand myself more. But with this language and with these things, I'm able to just understand because I understand that we have capacities we have limitations. And whenever Sarah says, I just do not have any men- my any mental capacity to be able to do that, even though, like, like we could be Saturday yeah. and there's no work, right. no more jobs. It, it, We're but, just hanging out. But just hanging out and not able to do the things that she truly wants to do, which is to write, which is to create. And there's not the, have, it doesn't have the ability to do that because- I didn't give myself any margin throughout the rest of the week. Right. Right. And and I didn't take space. Like that was another thing I think that's always been kind of difficult for you to understand in this scenario is that me being at home all day but with you there is Correct. not alone time. <laughs> right. And that I did not understand, I mean, until this year. I mean, we've been married yeah. for 12 years. Yeah. And there was nothing that was keeping me from understanding other than the fact that I just didn't understand. Right. Because of my own emotional and my own own emotional and relational needs and my own emotional and relational capacities. So this is more personal than it is universal. But I have a specific like need for quantity time. Yes. And my need for quantity time blinded me to Sarah's limitation of being with other people. Yeah. Because I never felt as though my quantity equated to the right quality. I just wanted to keep, put going. In, keep going and put in more quantity. Mm-hmm. Because if I just put in more quantity, it'll eventually reach the quality I'm looking for. <laughs> and it did nothing but deteriorate the quality until the point where I'm depressed. Yeah. You know, because I, I can't, I, I haven't been able to do it. Yeah. But it's because I, I did not have the emotional intelligence, right. you know, specifically at the time and n- not the uh, intelligence at all of well, the way we operate within our limitations. Yeah. I couldn't understand. I, I didn't have the ability to at the time. Right. Um, but now that I do have the ability, that's why we're recording this on this podcast, because I truly believe that it is a very, very helpful thing to understand and potentially one of the things that you need to understand Mm -hmm. in order to move forward in becoming the person that you want to become instead of remaining a person that is shaped and created by our culture and our society Mm -hmm. of chronic overload 
Yeah. So that's the thing with with what the society with which we are living in in the Western world, the, the in the postmodern world that we are outsourcing or exporting to the rest of the world. Yeah. Uh, we have reached the point, especially in our modern cities, of chronic overload. For sure. Where we have activity overload, change overload, debt overload, information overload, choice overload, commitment overload, expectation overload, media overload, noise overload, all of these things. And that's not in like a uh, exhaustive list. That's just a few examples yeah. of things that we are overloaded with. The thing is, is that we are being overloaded and if we could just realize that they want us overloaded, we would stop being overloaded because it is only beneficial to, you know, the ethereal they. Right. <laughs> it, the, it is only beneficial to them for us to be overloaded. Right. It is, it is beneficial to social media platforms for us to be at our max capacity and then what do we do well we scroll so that we can you know turn our brain off for a second well that's first of all very unhealthy for us and only makes them money like it is beneficial for our society to have us overloaded for us to not be actually thinking about these things because if we thought about these things we'd change everything and then society as we know it would not run right Right, exactly. If we thought about these things, we would stop participating in the systems of which run our economic right. society. Right. And it's not, I mean, it is obviously about like consumerism and stuff like that, but it's not really. It's just about actually being aware of who is controlling your life. Right. Is it you or is it your brain on autopilot that the TV is telling you to? I mean, that, right. you know. Right. And whenever society at large and everyone around you looks similarly to what you look like. And I don't mean in physical appearance. I mean that their schedule, their uh, values, right. their theology, their philosophy, the things that they deem as success, the things that, that they praise in you, all of those things create this um, appearance, this lie mm -hmm. that you are in control of who you are, that ultimately you are free because you are moving towards what our society deems as fulfillment. Right. But we haven't even stopped to ask ourselves if that's what will fulfill us. Right. It's so funny how we sit there and believe mm -hmm. that we are fulfilled while also being chronically overloaded to the point where we are so anxious, mm -hmm. so depressed that there is now an entire burnout economy. Right. Where instead of an economy of things that are treating the actual uh, problems, we instead create an entire industry that is that is treating the symptoms. Mm -hmm. So the burnout economy is a treat yourself economy. Oh yeah, the essential oils economy. Mm -hmm. The you know the spa I was, day. I was going to say the self care. The self care. The rise of self care in the last few years. Ultimately, it's a good thing. Clearly, you know, it's a good message, I should say. There's a reason that it has become its own market. Right. And you know? what's insane is if you zoom out of the burnout economy that is selling fixes for the symptoms of a problem that right. ultimately it created. Right. Um, I'm assuming if you're listening to this, this won't lose you, but you never know in today's day and age. Um, it's exactly what Trump is doing. Yeah. Like Trump creates problems and then he comes back and with a, solution. with a solution to that problem and then praises his response to the problem that he created. Mm -hmm. People who are not able to see past that or see larger view of that and only see the, you know, within that tunnel vision of a moment, believe that. Right. But it's so easy to understand if you are not living at your capacity you're mm -hmm. not you're living below that so you can see the world through a larger lens that is much bigger than today's you know problems yeah, I, think, I think we've lost our ability to connect things mm -hmm. is maybe one of the problems in ourselves and in society at large like right. i think and it starts with ourself it starts with yourself like you know if you don't give yourself margin then you don't connect things you don't like one of one of the things I'm really realizing uh, with one of the books I'm reading, 
we did a podcast, the last podcast, I think, Women Who Run With the Wolves, is just how connected, like, heart, mind, body, soul, the natural world, all of it is is so interconnected, it's not even funny, but Western culture really doesn't like connecting anything. Like, we right. don't think that our body has anything to do with our emotional or mental health. Mm -hmm. And it's so clearly, I mean, scientifically proven that it's connected. Right. Our body stores our trauma, our lower gut health affects depression. Our, you know, like everything is connected, but we have not been taught to look for the connections. We've been taught the opposite. We've been taught the opposite because if you're not looking for the connections, then they can do what they want. Then, then you live right where they want you, which is not paying attention. Like we've lost our ability to connect everything. Mm -hmm. And I think if you just focus on that with yourself first, you will learn on a larger scale how everything is connected. You'll be able to see the truth woven throughout everything, I think. Yes, everything is connected. And until you get to the point where you accept and realize and truly experience that everything is connected, I think then you are living above what your emotional and spiritual limit is. Yeah, because this is a good example. Your physical capacity might be incredibly high, but your emotional or spiritual capacity is lower. So you you have to match your physical capacity to your your mental and spiritual. You can't keep going, even though your body could keep going. Right. Your soul can't keep going. Yeah. You know. So it's it's understanding all of those things. Yeah. It's a, it's really hard to accept that. It is. So maybe I could explain it like this. If you have, let's just call it 10 different capacities, you have your your body, your mind, your emotions, your spiritual life, all of those things. They're all different sized cups yeah. on the table, but you have a bottle of, of water. And that bottle of water, the water that is contained within that bottle is ultimately your capacity. Mm -hmm. If you pour the water into those cups, you could fill up your body cup mm -hmm. all the way full but then as you start to pour that water into the other cups you're not able to fill them much at all because your old your overall capacity is completely taken up by the right. by this one thing you're focusing on which left no margin for the rest of it right and so you're actually sacrificing when you choose one thing you're sacrificing other things yes and that means that you may be sacrificing emotional and spiritual health. Mm -hmm. You may be sacrificing relational health with family and friends. You may mm -hmm. be sacrificing goals of, of work, whatever you call that capacity. You may be focusing so much on that that your economic capacity mm -hmm. is limited because you're not able to uh, balance those things. Right. And balance is probably a word that we should be using because I think that, that balance is where you want to get. Yeah. And, and what brought this up is what Sarah said of, if you have a high capacity in something, you have to recognize that and recognize that just because that's an easy cup to fill doesn't mean it should be filled the entire way because it blinds you to these other things that ultimately lead you to living a whole and yeah. beautiful life. I mean, we've all seen people who have achieved incredible things and then watched their personal life crumble behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. We all, we all know it. We've mm -hmm. all seen it. It's because we're not connecting that everything is interconnected. What we can do matters physically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It all has to work together. It's not about underachieving. If mm -hmm. you're an insane runner, great, you know, but it is about learning how to balance all of those capacities because you can't just go straight for, well, this is me. I'm going to run to my heart's content. Like there are capacities. If you also have a family, you have to give them time and energy, which will take away from time and energy running or whatever. Like mm -hmm. it just, it, it's all connected. As I've been talking, I've been trying to figure out how to connect these things to a to a story because I feel like it's hard to really understand, you know. Yeah, I mean, just the, like, it's such a it's such a concept that we 
we just don't consider in Western society. So it's hard to really grasp it. Right. Which obviously, I guess we did, we did talk about your story in that you, you have a specific set of limitations that, right. you know, you even though you, you had plenty of time, right. your capacity had been reached because you have a low social capacity. Right. And because of that, it doesn't matter how much time you have if that capacity has been reached because you can't operate being a, a truly who you are. You can't operate in who Sarah is. Right. If, if you have reached that, no matter how much time you have. So I guess another story, since it's the only stories we have is yours and mine. And, you know, I moved to New York City. I, I was very much a an achievement person. Mm -hmm. um, my entire life, I have been somebody who has very much been in the business realm, been labeled personally and by others as an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. And I think our generation of of achievers, our generation of you can be whoever you want to be has led us to becoming a generation where we're entrepreneurs of ourselves. Yeah. That each one of us is like an entrepreneur of who we want to become and we have to work at it and mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. And that's when we become fatigued and you know start to think that nothing is real. And that happened to me too. Um, <laughs> now that I think about it. Uh, <laughs> so I know I was, I was achievement. I business, 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 work, work, work. The, yeah. you know, the, my, my five-year goals, you know, the first thing I wrote on my paper would have been make a million dollars. Like yeah. it would all always been about money and achievement and like working and entrepreneurship. And it wasn't even about the money itself. It was just about that. Doing it so you could do it. Right. Because that's what society tells me. That's mm -hmm. what my local society is, what my, you know, national society, it's what the books and the people I was surrounded with and like all these things about this is how you achieve. And ultimately holiness and achievement were my idols. Mm -hmm. And through that, moving to New York City, just finding easy kind of success, but also uh, not successful enough in what I wanted, mm -hmm. you know, all of those types of things. And I was reaching my limit, my capacity of becoming the person that I wanted to become because I was reaching, I was maxing out the things that came easy to me. Right. I was living with no margin to, to fill the cups that were my emotional health, my mm -hmm. spiritual health, my, you know, different things like that. Like I was, I was filling them some, I mean, if you look at our journey through New York, through our videos and through our podcast, obviously we both were thinking much bigger things. We weren't stuck in this like one specific tunnel vision of achievement. Right. But at the same time, while I was in New York over the course of the two years, I came out of that with this philosophy, with this mantra. I came to believe that New York steals every available resource for my external survival and my external growth because of rent being so high. You know, New York is the greatest city in the world if you can get somebody else to pay the rent, mm -hmm. um, to quote LC LCD Sound System. Mm -hmm. um, and I believe that wholeheartedly. For sure. If if you want to do a wrap up what I believe about New York in my course of living there, New York City is the greatest city in the world if you can get somebody else to pay the rent. Yep. And because there was nobody else to pay the rent, that capacity, my economic capacity, meant I had to trade almost all of my time Mm -hmm. to convert that into money in order to live, which was the bare minimum of survival without being homeless. Right. So almost my entire capacity of time was taken up because of my need to survive. Yeah. All of my capacity was completely stolen from my external survival. And what I wanted to move so that I could create more margin for my internal growth. I could create more margin for my internal survival. Right. Moving to Portland allowed us to do that. And it did exactly what I was hoping it would do. And Portland didn't be didn't end up being exactly what I was hoping it would, but that's but it did exactly what I hoped it would in allowing me that freedom, that margin to become an emotional and spiritual holistic being again. Right. Um, or for the first time really. I was thinking again in the moment, but I didn't even realize there was more to be had because I was so stuck up within the knowledge that I knew that I didn't even know what it was like to know what I didn't know. And once I stepped outside of that, I realized and I became so aware of the big picture that my little picture of life that I had been operating in became so trivial and so meaningless mm -hmm. that it became comical to me. 
Yeah. And so within that, that was that is an entire story about margin. It's an it's a story about having the the space between my load and my limits so that I could work on myself. Right. And you know, we live in this culture of the chronic overload, like I mentioned, and, you know, I, I listed a few things. And to give an example of what that means to be chronically overloaded is, you know, within information, let's say, we have information overload in our life and in our world yeah. because of social media, because of media media, because of mm-hmm. news, because of all of these things and advertising and, and just all things. It's all information that we are taking in. And we just aren't designed to, to take in process and actually be able to do anything with that amount of information. You know, in the 17th century, people knew less in their entire life than one single issue of a current New York Times. Yeah, it's insane. And it is not that those people didn't have the capacity to know more necessarily. We've just progressed in our systems and... right abilities to spread information correct and that's that that democratization of information has allowed us to ultimately become a much more enlightened and knowledgeable society yeah it's a good thing it is ultimately a good thing but the the thing that we have lost is that holistic view yeah i mean i think it's ultimately a good thing obviously to be able to know and learn and read more but you you have to learn how to learn and read more. It's not just something that you do. Like we have to learn how to exist in this world. If we're talking about reading a New York Times article or an entire issue of New York Times, like you have to give yourself time to actually process it. You know, like it's not, it's not about like, oh, don't read the news. Though I do think you should, um, Again, that is another limit that some that everyone has. Some people can handle more news than others. News, by definition, is sensationalized. So know your limit on what you can handle. (laughs) But if we're talking about like reading an entire issue of The New York Times, that's wonderful. But our brain on a not just on an emotional level, but on a logistical level, our brain can't actually filter that much information. So it just dumps it. So it's like kind of a waste of time if you don't learn how to read it, Mm -hmm. if you don't learn how to process, how to give the time your brain needs to process things. Right. There's this frantic feeling that we all feel of like, oh, I just need to get there. So we we overload ourselves because we just feel like we need to we need to get there. We need hurry up and wait. You know, that's kind of Mm -hmm. it's like that. Like we don't feel like we should waste our time, right. you know, like we need to hurry up and get where we're going. So we're not wasting our time. But if you don't do it correctly in the ways in which you are capable of doing it, then it is a total waste of time. Like if you read an entire issue of the New York times and give yourself no space to process it, and then your brain just dumps all of it because it can't handle that much information. It was a waste of your time. Mm-hmm. So, There also is something to be said about knowing and learning how to process all of this information. It's not a bad thing to have all of the information available to you, but you still have a responsibility in learning how to process it. To know that, you have to know why you do everything. Yeah. You have to know why are you giving yourself over to four hours on social media a day. Right. I'm not saying that there is anything implicitly wrong or good about it. It just is. The fact is, if the why brings value to the life of the person who's spending the time, Mm -hmm. then that's an answer. Right. But if the answer is, I don't know. Right. I don't know why I spend this amount of time doing this thing. I don't know why I do this. I don't know why I uh, give myself over to this television show or spend this amount mm-hmm. of time doing these things. If you don't know why, that means that you are not in control. Right. You are being controlled and manipulated by some form of economic system Yeah. that has hacked you into, it makes you believe that you are making these choices of your own free will. Right. I think also within that you have to part of this conversation of self-awareness is understanding um, that there is a society who tells you what your capacity should be. And we sort of put that on other people. Mm -hmm. And you have to remember that like other people's capacities are going to be completely different than yours. Mm -hmm. So in the conversation of social justice, for example, somebody else is going to have a way higher capacity 
maybe than you are. Right. So yelling at someone that they have to care about every single issue and, you know, and, and not just care about every single issue, but commit equal amounts of resources and time and energy to each and every issue is unfair. Mm -hmm. It is incredibly unfair because I mean, it just, it's, it makes so much sense. Like one person is going to be called to gender equality and one person is going to be called to racial equality. It doesn't mean they don't support each other, right? but their, their actions are going to be completely different and that's not bad. Mm -hmm. That's like how it works. Yeah. (laughs) That within this of understanding yourself more again we have a hard time understanding that everything is connected and we have a hard time understanding that other people have a different life than we do right but it's it's all connected but but they're not held to the same responsibility that you feel you are held to and that's the thing i think is maybe placing obligation and expectation on other people correct um that i feel like it's expectation overload Yeah. In the same way that we're expected to take in all of this information, we're also now expected to do things. And that expectation creates pressure. That expectation or obligation creates a burden. It creates pressure in your life to do something. Whenever you are constantly thinking about those expectations and those pressures, then you can't think about what truly matters, which is the person that you're trying to become or the things that you're trying to do, which means it's stealing your attention. It's stealing your capacity. Right. If you let it. And I think one thing that more that would be maybe a more universal feeling is the expectation that is put on you by maybe your parents. Yeah. Or the expectation that is put on you by a social group or Mm -hmm. the expectation that is put on you by schooling. For sure. You're expected to act a certain way. You're expected to do certain things and you're expected to participate in in certain activities in a certain way. Yes. Because that if you, you are expected to do that because if to not do that would be to not participate in what everybody else wants right. of you because they expect something of you. Mm-hmm. And whenever you are fully operating within that expectation and that obligation, it's just stealing every single emotional and mental capacity that you have because you're now thinking about all of that stuff Mm -hmm. instead of thinking about what you want to think about because of all of these expectations that are being put on you. Yeah. It's just overbearing, which we will get to in next week's episode because we're going to talk about multiple intelligence theory. We kind of have a few episodes lined up that are all within this same theme that that kind of lay out a philosophy or a theory about Mm -hmm. intelligence. But back to today's conversation about limitations within that expectation overload. Mm -hmm. How do we fix this? We're running out of time, so I don't think we need to spend a lot of time on it. But my solution is to slow down. For sure. It, it is the first step to anything is slow down. Um, Anne Lamont has a quote that I think we all need to put into our heart. No is a complete sentence. Yeah, I like that quote. And if you have these expectations in your life and they are ta- – the expectation itself – it's not even that the ask is something that's huge and is going to take a bunch of your time, but the expectation of having to do that thing right. takes away your mental capacity to do the things that you are trying to do before and after yeah. the thing that you are expected to do is. The right. expectation itself is stealing your capacity. Yeah. I have a very low expectation capacity. <laughs> <laughs> And at the end of the day, no is a complete sentence and we have to utilize the word no. Yeah. That I, for my margin, for my capacity, for the person that I want to be, I cannot do those things. And you don't even have to explain it because you are your own person and you can make your own decisions. You have the ability and the right and there's nothing wrong with if somebody asks you to do something and give more of yourself away, you can say no. Yeah. I think also... Just starting with um, maybe observing your natural rhythms Mm -hmm. is a good way to to starting to understand your limitations and capacities and margin. You know, obviously we're talking, we've been talking a lot about expectations at present. And I think one of those expectations is what your day should look like. Mm -hmm. You know, the natural flow of your day. Everyone writes articles all the time about 
the most successful people's morning routine. Yeah, I've heard you know, that the, and, the hardest thing about having a morning routine is not subjecting others to yours. Exactly. But I think observing your natural rhythms is a, maybe a good place to start. For example, I have always, I mean, how many years have I been talking about? I literally cannot get up in the morning. Like, it's just so hard for me. I am a terrible morning person. And I've just like given up on the idea of being a morning person because I'm just not. I'm not a morning person and I don't feel guilty about it anymore. And so I know like I work best late morning to lunch and then in the evening. But like my afternoon after lunch, I am so I I feel as if I do in the morning. Like I just it's not my vibe, you know, and I've just quit yelling at myself for not being able to be productive in the ways that I have been conditioned to believe are productive, mm -hmm. right? And so I think like just observing your natural rhythms will maybe start to point out who you are. And like if you're introverted or extroverted or, um, you know, whatever, it'll start pointing out your capacities and just kind of start there. Just yeah. observe the way you operate. Right. Comfortably, not not when you're feeling pressured to operate. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? There's a difference. Yeah. And I think that, you know, my solution is to slow down. And as I have been slowing down, it has brought nothing but more joy, contentment, and connection in my life to let go and right. to slow. It really will save us all if we let it. <laughs> So that is kind of where we'll wrap it up. Um, I know that I didn't get into a, you know, how do you slow down? But these conversations just cannot happen in one podcast. I mean, the, oh, this, yeah. these are lifelong journey things, but just understanding limitations, capacities, and trying to fight for margin in your life so that you can operate freely within the person that you are outside of societal pressures, outside of the things that you are expected and obligated to be and to do because of family, because of location, because of geography, you know, all of these things. Once you get to the place where you are no longer in need of nor desire the things of the world, then you can truly fit within Pascal's quote of all men's miseries derive from not being able to sit in a quiet room alone. Very true. And I know that seems like an impossibility to some of you because I've talked to many people who can't even fathom sitting in silence because of the internal clutter, the emotional loudness that presents itself the moment that they are quiet alone. Getting through that is the only way to. It goes away. Contentment. Yeah. The longer you sit, the more it goes away. Yeah, I think it, it goes away and it is, it is worth the journey. Really, really, really worth the journey, even though the journey itself is a long, hard, narrow, treacherous road um, that you will not get to the other side with um, ease because there will be so many internal things fighting you because the desires of, of your ego and the desires of this world are insanely strong. Societal pressures are one of the strongest forces in a human life. And yeah. getting like over that doesn't happen overnight or through one podcast. Um, it is a, for some people, unfortunately, a lifelong journey. And for some of us, we have been blessed with the realization at a young age and we're able to navigate the rest of our life you know in mm -hmm. in that state but I, I want as many people as possible to get to that feeling and as we've been talking you know we've been talking about the capacity of time the capacity of of achievement the capacity of um, who we are and all of the overloads of the world and I would like to end with a poem by Mary Oliver and it's probably her most famous poem but or at least one line is her most famous <laughs> <right>. line. <laughs> one line is her most famous line because it's actually misused, misinterpreted and misappropriated to achievement culture um, instead of what she is actually talking about, which is slowing and recognizing. And another quote from her to describe the poem before we read is 
attention is the beginning of devotion. Yes. The Summer Day by Mary Oliver. Who made the world? Who made the swan and the black bear? Who made the grasshopper? This grasshopper, I mean. The one who has flung herself out of the grass. The one who is eating sugar out of my hand. Who is moving her jaws back and forth instead of up and down. Who is gazing around with her enormous and complicated eyes. Now she lifts her pale forearms and thoroughly washes her face. Now she snaps her wings open and floats away. I don't know exactly what a prayer is. I do know how to pay attention, how to fall down into the grass, how to kneel down in the grass, how to be idle and blessed, how to stroll through the fields, which is what I have been doing all day. Tell me, what else should I have done? Doesn't everything die at last and too soon? Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? We have one wild and precious life, and are we going to give it away to a society of money and control or keep it for ourselves and pay attention to the world of which we belong? Thank you for listening to this episode of Deeply Curious. Uh, In the next episode, we'll be talking about the multiple intelligence theory. See you then.